Awesome. Uh, we <laughs> you, you can have an orange one if you want. Morning all. Good morning, John. How are you? Good morning, Edwina. Bless you guys. I am I am around. You can't see me, but I am no, here. No, I can't. Hey, can't see you, but can I hear you? I am here. This is my hand waving. Uh, <laughs> we're, we're getting a better shot of everyone. Morning, Pastor John. Morning. Morning, Pastor Edwina. Morning, Stephen. How are you doing? Good, good. I'm doing good. Early. Awesome. What a blessing. We are we're just about to start. So I'm going to ask uh, Bro Matthew if you would pray. And uh, we'll do a bit of feedback from yesterday. We had a great time. This is day two. And just get a little bit of feedback, uh, feedback from yesterday of how everyone felt. And then I'm going to pass it on to... Um, Pass it on to Bruce, who is going to do an awesome session on getting on the right side of sin, which is uh, excellent. So, uh, Pops Thank Matthew. Thank you, Ruben. Thank you. Good, good morning, everyone from uh, Malay, Australia, Melbourne, to those in uh, morning, to those in Sri Lanka. In uh, I'm just looking at the names: Malaysia, uh, Myanmar, and there's nobody from US, so we can't say good evening yet. So thank you very much, and so let's uh, thank you for joining us for, from wherever you are. And we just, as we start the day, we just want to pray first. Father, we thank you for this glorious day you've given us, Lord God. As we start the second day of the conference, Lord, we just thank you for the wonderful work that we did, you did yesterday with Bruce and the worship. And we thank you, Lord, that as we lead into today in, in continuing in the series on leadership, Lord, we just want to give you all glory, honor, and praise. And Lord, we just ask the Holy Spirit to come fill this place and everyone's home where they're coming in from, fill them with your glory and your presence, Lord God. And Lord, let just thank you. Well, you just want to thank you for your wonderful presence here. And we just want to give you all glory, honor, and praise. And we just, as we prepare our hearts to receive the word, Lord, just thank you for all we're doing here is for one purpose only, that is to glorify your name, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord, and we give you all glory, honor, and praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, Pops Matthew. Um, those of us who were here yesterday, uh, so those, you can see us, we've got a lot of our leadership here um, at home, and uh, with, <clears throat> yeah, he's taken the lion's share, um, with uh, COVID restrictions in Melbourne, we've just eased to, we could only have 15 people, we can now have 30 at home, so yay, we're celebrating. I think I read that uh, 19 days, is it, or oh, nine days, we've had no community transmission? Probably 19 days, and I read this morning, yeah, and praise God for that, so we're believing God for the rest of uh, the nations and the other parts of the state as well, because uh, nothing is impossible, amen. Um, had a great session yesterday. 
Papa Luke, you want to switch on and tell us uh, what you got from it? Because we, we couldn't stop talking afterwards about what uh, Brucey shared, simple message that was so effective and that was really great on commitment. On Padre Bruce shared. We're just turning on mics. I think he's on now. Hello, everyone. Good morning. Good to see you again today. And um, yeah, yesterday was the only way I can describe what happened last night is a fresh bread from heaven. Um, a lot has been uh, uh, really like the veil of uh, that covered the face of Moses. There has been so much veil, things that have kept uh, kept us from seeing and knowing what our Heavenly Father has given to us. Uh, the session last night was um, amazing. Amazing in the sense that leadership, as we know it, um, it's, it's, it's not as difficult and tasking as uh, the world and religion has made it to be. But today, I will encourage everyone, if you missed that uh, session last night, uh, it's going to be available. Uh, it's already available. Thank you very much. Can I say, please get to listen to the message last night and... Um, it will blow your mind away. Already there is this amazing testimony uh, that came from Sri Lanka last night that, um, you know, when God do something, the effect will always be not just temporal, but lasting. And in the same way, I really believe that this morning is going to be the same. Um, I know that Bruce is here. You can see I'm sitting just next to him. I want to stay as close as where the anointing is. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we, we want to say you are, you are most welcome. I can see people from New Zealand, uh, Malaysia, uh, Myanmar, and all around the world. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's going to be a glorious time again. So we are grateful. We, we thank God for the gift of this day. I spoke last night, I said there is difference between uh, uh, Kairos as well as uh, Kronos. When we talk of timing in everything, Kronos timing speaks about the seconds and minutes and hours and days and weeks and months and years kind of a thing. Um, but Kairos moments is when heaven choose to do something spectacular. It could just be a split second, something, something. I mean, the, the, for the disciples of Jesus that we are traveling to Emmaus after his resurrection, the, when Jesus met them and uh, communed with them, at the end, their reaction was, did not our heart burn when he was talking to us? That those are Kairos moments when God drops something that will shake something in you. So... Uh, this morning's topic uh, is uh, it's a freeing one, in as much as it can, some can think it's controversial. But to me, the Bible says, truth shall set you free. Not just set free, truth shall make you free. So we are pleased and blessed to have our beloved uh, brother, Bruce. And uh, I thank God for you, Bruce, and the honor to get you started. I think I've talked too much. I don't want to take your time. <laughs> yep. Let, brothers and sisters around the globe, let us welcome our beloved uh, brother, uh, Pastor Bruce. Over to you, Bruce. Thank you very much. Let's put our hands together. God bless you. Thank you. you can see how relaxed I am and how comfortable I'm sitting here. Yep. And I'm sitting next to Papa Luke. So if we end up just having a bromance here <laughs> <laughs> and Matthew, you, uh, you'll understand. Sorry. Uh, g'day, everyone online. I can now see you this time. I, I, had my, uh, I had you off to the side. No, they don't want my picture. So you can see me sitting up the back there on the sofa. I'm waving at you now. 
and I'm going to share my screen with you. And um, so if you can hear me clearly, just wave for us. Just give me a bit of a wave. So that's two people can hear me and the rest have lost that. <laughs> that's good. Thank you. Um, we're going to continue just in that attitude of connecting with Dad in the process of just doing Kingdom Family Business. We're just going to open our hearts and minds to him again today. Uh, we're going to pray because we like talking to Dad and um, we want Holy Spirit to guide, the, guide our thoughts, guide our hearts, open us, change us so that we'll never be the same. So Dad, we thank you that um, we can be family and distance doesn't stop that. We thank you that we can be close or far and that your love is as real to us and through us to each other, regardless of distance. And we want to thank you that um, as children of a heavenly father, there's a dynamic of grace and a dynamic of love, a dynamic of life, a dynamic of love and light that... Um, you have designed to overrun all things. This is your heart's desire, and you've given us this glorious opportunity to steward that, and also to, uh, in I like to say, infect the world with it. Mm. And so, um, I know we're in a time where there's a where there's a viral thing happening in the world, and some people are afraid of it, and some people are having a really tough time. In Melbourne, we were locked down for quite a period of time at one stage, so we understand how you feel. Um, but we want to say to you that we are with you and um, we are not afraid. Um, we have a dad who is bigger than all this. And so we say that the kingdom is um, infiltrating. Maybe yes. that's a better yes. word. Yes. For those who will let it dominate their horizon and their expectations. So we, we receive that now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, I'm going to share my screen with you, friends, and um, I'm going to talk to you about a topic that um, in one way is fresh bread for me as well. Uh, and what, I, what we mean by fresh bread is what has be, God been saying to us in this season that asks us to both receive the bread of life, uh, and it's a word that will often guide, direct, or even correct us. And for me... Uh, I've been on this journey for a little while and um, I'm really loving what God has done in me. He's really challenging me to change my perspective and he's challenging me to understand that his, his love is bigger than my need to be right or wrong or my need to judge or any of the historical sort of attitudes that I was taught. So I want to share, uh, and the topic um, sort of, hopefully it, it gives you a bit of an idea, getting on the right side of sin. Uh, sin is a, a, a topic in the scriptures, and so we don't want to pretend it's not. Um, in the church, interestingly enough, you will find multiple views on how to approach the issue of sin. Um, You'll find some churches who are heavily focused on sin and judgment and it's sort of like they nearly have the gospel of sin because that seems to be the main thing they talk about. Um, now that's just so you know the gospel is meant to be good news and if you're talking about sin and surviving it and combating it, you're not actually working into your potential. You're just It's like you're looking at and you're struggling to get a view on who you are. So instead of walking in the victory, you're walking in the defeat. And so there are other churches that don't focus on it at all. Um, and so we have the two extremes. Some ignore it, and, and that's not helpful. And some focus it on it only, and that's not helpful. I think there's a, a biblical perspective um, to the place of sin and I think, and, and I'm talking to, to everybody, and I know, uh, again, I don't know the backgrounds you're from. I don't know the church teaching and context you've grown up in. Um, I'm aware of some, and I will share from one perspective at least, from my own. Um, this may push your buttons a little bit, because if you're 
um, really married to an idea of judgment and sin, and there's one idea about sin in scriptures, what I'm going to suggest to you is that there's more than one. And, and I'm going to also suggest to you that the one I grew up with is actually not what the Bible says. And so I'm going to highlight that and then hopefully give you an opportunity at the back end to ask, to ask yourself some questions about what's the Bible actually saying and then see if you need to change your, your perception or mature it. Or you might be 100% lined up with what the Bible says, but I haven't met that many Christians who are. I've met people who've got bits of it and I'm not claiming to have all of it, but I'm, I am claiming to be on the journey of saying I want to hear what Dad has to say about this. Um, so I think it's an important topic and the reason I think it's an important topic is because um, it will shape your view on sin will shape how you view God and how you view others and given that we're called to love God and love each other yes. how you see God and his reaction and his view on sin and how you see others and what how sin relates to them and yourself will have a huge impact on how you do relationship. And that's why I think it's important, and, and this is specifically important for people who are going to disciple others, because um, you need to know that you give away what you have. So if your view on sin and God's judgment um, is, um, shapes how you interact with God, like if God is angry with you and he's always trying to hunt you down and, and, and punish you for your sin, if that's what you truly believe, that's what you'll teach others. And so the seed that you have, you'll multiply, even if that seed is a weed. Yeah? And the same's true about if, if you think sin in your life is such a dominant issue, you'll probably... Uh, one of the, there's an interesting statement. Um, in the past, we were a slave to sin, but now we sin by faith. <laughs> so, you, so you're not actually required to sin anymore. And it says, do not sin. So it, it's possible because in the past we were slave to sin. Mm. But when you've died and risen in Christ, you now just have a habit mm. or a condition. Mm. You're not a slave. So now you sin by faith because you, you do it by choice. That's right. You don't do it by nature. Yes. And so how you, how you see sin fitting into things <laughs> um, will be really important. It also affects your understanding of the gospel. Now let me, let me give you an example of one of the things that um, I, I was told when I was younger. God cannot look upon sin. Who's heard that? God cannot look upon sin. And, and so I would ask the question, is this true? God cannot look upon sin. And, and we'd say, yes, it's true. So, um, so that means God can't have a relationship with me because I'm a wicked sinner. And, and even when I got saved, I was still a sinner saved by grace. I hadn't actually got to the grace bit. I was still labelled as a sinner. Um, <laughs> And so my, my identity was still attached to what was wrong, not what God had done to make things right. That's right. Um, and so I used to have this idea that um, God cannot look upon sin, and that's why he's really upset with everyone. And so the gospel was actually about sin. So, you know, God made mankind good and we sinned. First thing that's mentioned about us is we've sinned. And yeah, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And the wages of sin are death. And here's the good news. God wants to kill you because you've sinned. Because sin leads to death. And here's how he resolved it. He had one and only loved son and he killed him instead of you. So, so far I haven't heard the good news. I'm just trying to find anything in there that's good. He wants to kill me and then he kills Jesus instead. And then he says, and this is so you can have a relationship with a God who wants to kill you and killed his own son. Now, I wonder if the world, when they hear that, think, maybe I don't want to know this God that's so angry and his core business is running around killing people. And, and, and I, it's only been in recent years where I've realised such a toxic focus on sin and a misunderstanding of what's happened in the scriptures about it means we produce a gospel that is just a, uh, an escape package from sin. And the God of heaven and earth has one reputation. He's angry and he wants to kill sinners. Mm. In that message. Now... I'm not saying that Jesus didn't die um, to deal with sin. Reuben has a great saying. He says, did Jesus die for sin or did he die for you? Because if he died for sin, you don't matter. <laughs> You're not in the equation. But what if he actually died in your place for you for a different reason? And, we'll, and hopefully we'll have enough time to get to some of that today. I want to tell you the rest of this passage actually tells us, because I, I, I used to ask my, uh, the group around me, um, here's, here's a paradigm problem. 
If God cannot look upon sin, and Jesus said, I am the Father of one, so if you know me, you know the Father, did Jesus, who being God in the very likeness of God, have to walk around with his eyes shut? Because if he can't look upon sin, if God can't look upon sin, did Jesus walk around with his eyes shut? And all the people that grew up with this sort of paradigm that I did, God can't look upon sin, sort of stop and go, oh, hang on a minute. Do you know what happened? The passage here, Habakkuk 1.13, goes on to say, so I'll read from one version, your eyes are too pure to look on evil, which is where this idea is God cannot look upon sin. And then it goes on, you cannot tolerate wrongdoing. Well, that's fair enough. That's okay. Even as parents, we, we, we don't want to see bad things and we don't want to see wrongdoing, do we? So we can, even we could imagine that. And then it says, why then do you tolerate the treacherous and why do you look at them? So in one, it, it's a question. And what we did is we took one part of it and made a theology, which is not true. God can look upon sin. He can. He, he's more than capable of it. Like parents are capable of watching their children be naughty. It's not like we're not capable of it. We are. What's another issue? And we talked about this. What role does sin play in your gospel or your good news? Is God just dealing with a sin issue? And we're going to look at the, the early texts and the stories where sin enters into the equation and just pose a few questions for you to think about. And the reason I want leaders to do this, any leader, whether you're leading one person or whether you're leading someone to Jesus, is if you don't know the true place of sin, the right side of sin that we stand on, you will then lead others into the same misunderstanding as you have because uh, you can only give away what you have. And, and there's a passage in... Um, in Matthew, um, when Jesus is rebuking the scribes and the Pharisees, where he says, you'll walk a thousand miles to get a convert and make them twice as much deserving of hell as you are. Mm. And the hell he's talking about is Gehenna, and it's the stinky life. Mm. Because the things that they tell them are stinky. And I want to say, some people's gospel is a stinky gospel. Yeah. It smells more like hell than it smells like heaven, because their issue is too much focused on sin. They haven't got it in its right place. Because it's the love of God that sends Jesus to rescue us, which is the gospel. And in the process of the rescue and the restoration and the reconciliation, sin is resolved. It's not sin's not the gospel. Sin's something that's resolved in the process of God's love being reaching out and restoring us to God's purpose and design. And so that's why I'm saying it's really important. You can end up with half theologies, half baked teachings from people that have got, and, and most of the time I think it's not because people want it, I think it's just they inherited it and they didn't question it. And I'm not even having a go at the ones that gave it to us, they, they were being faithful, they were just misguidedly faithful. And so I'm, I'm kind of fortunate that I question everything, it really annoys most people who are trying to teach me, um, but it's given me the opportunity to go back to the, what the word says and the context of what the word is saying and then start to ask the questions. If it doesn't make sense, it's highly likely um, I've got the wrong response. And this just reminds us, uh, did Jesus die for our sins or did he die for us? Did, and, and like the gospel has often been put this way, isn't it? Um, uh, you sin, you go to hell. Jesus comes and fixes that so you can go to heaven. And in between, you just wait and sing and give money to the church to keep the elders happy or something. Um, and I've got to tell you that that doesn't reflect anything that the Bible talks about because uh, it's God's job to get you to heaven, not yours. And it's yours, your job to get heaven to earth. That's why it's, they will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. So what is sin? In the Hebrew and in the Greek... Um, sin is very much and very simply uh, missing the right path or falling short of the full design. And so the archery analogy has been used and it's quite good because if, you sh if you're standing back at a distance and you shoot an arrow towards a target, is it, like you may miss the target completely, but out of out of a hundred, you might get it right by ninety nine, and 
And so missing the target may be only by a degree. Uh, you may have the length right, but the accuracy wrong. You might have the length wrong and the accuracy right. But we, I've been taught that sin is like a light switch. It's either on or off. It either is, is or isn't. But in the Hebrew mindset, and this is why it's important for us to read and understand the concept of sin from the, from the author's intention and from the culture in which it was introduced. Because I think many of us have a view on sin that comes from either our own culture uh, or a Greek mindset, which was the latter culture. And, I, and I, I need you to understand something, and this is kind of a bit annoying, but it, it's contextually helpful. Most of you will know there have been great reformers down through history, like individuals like Martin Luther, uh, John Calvin, um, various major characters in history who were working with um, the language in Latin probably, it wasn't even in English or in their own country's language, and they were struggling to find what does the truth of the word of God say. And we see in these reformers, um, they place faith where it needed to be. Or they get the text to, they get the text to, to be more true rather than just man's traditions and religion. Now one of the, the problems, now, so I want to I wanna celebrate those heroes and I want you to know I do, but I need you to know one particular thing. The majority of them were lawyers. And so they see things through the lens of the lawyer, which is right and wrong, forensically correct or not. And so their interpretation isn't Hebrew. Their interpretation is, is, is the, the rightness and the wrongness of things, which is very different to degrees of missing the path. Right and wrong is either, you're either right or you're wrong. And so they were defending their case and making a case and we started to develop theologies that were more right and wrong rather than are you further from the path or closer to the path. And, and that is a really important understanding if you're going to read the scriptures. Because if you're going to read it like a lawyer, that means you're stuck in the old covenant everywhere. So it's not old covenant just in that small bit with Moses. It's old covenant in the garden. It's old covenant with Jesus. It's old Because if you read things from the lens of a lawyer, that's how you'll see it. And that's part of... It's an overcorrection. So most of the people in history have developed theologies as a reaction to another, not in the isolation of inspiration. It's a reaction to a lie. And so they make a correction, but it often swings a little bit like a pendulum a bit too far another way. And so what we're hoping we can do is, is, is sort of find that ground that was in the heart and mind of God and that was in the inspiration of the Spirit in that text which we're working from. We know the right path because we have a Father, we have Holy Spirit, and we have Jesus to guide us. Uh, and we know the right path in the beginning by what we were designed for. So who remembers that in the beginning um, we were made in God's image? And who, who knows that we were designed to reflect his glory? So we're, the source of life is God, true? And his glory is the Shekinah radiant presence of which, which inhabits the power of his nature and character is in his glory. And so there's light. So there's, in that creation narrative, there's life that's made by God and there's light that's made by God. And the very nature and currency of who God is is what? Love. So we have three key dynamics going on. Light. Life, love, in any order you like. I really don't mind. And if you're stepping out of the path, moving towards what would be, say, darkness, then you're sinning, whether it's by one degree or 99. If you're moving out of love, because you're made in God's image, if you're moving out of love, then that's, that would be described as missing the mark by one degree or 99. And the same is true with... Uh, life, if you're moving. People's life sometimes looks like they're dead just waiting to happen. Um, and some people are closer to that than others. And there's been times where aspects of my life have felt like that, where, where you just feel like you're just not living. We're just treading water or going backwards. Um, there'll be times when you feel hate or rage or bitterness or unforgiveness, and you know there's no love in you in that time. 
There's times when you're not full of the radiant goodness of the glory of God. You're just a bit of a dark rain cloud. These, all of these things are when we are missing our made in the image of God design. And this is more like what sin is talking about in that creation narrative that we see in the beginning. It's not black and white. It's not right and wrong. It's a degree of being close or far away, being intimate, being, being in the fullness of both the love of God, the light of God and the, and the life of God, or being at one degree or another off that path. And that's what sin was meant to mean in terms of what the scriptures tell us and what they were hoping for us to, to understand. Now, in the Bible narrative, we have... Sin gets a bit of a, a play right at the beginning, doesn't it? Right in the creation story. It doesn't talk about, it doesn't say, and they sinned. But we know that in the latter part of scripture, it talks about Adam and Eve sinning. So we know that it was sin. So in the context of Adam and Eve, um, they are made in God's image. They, made with a, they are made with, a, with an identity, but also with a purpose. So they're made to reflect the image of God and they're made to till and rule and replenish and be blessed. But they're also given some guidelines in terms of, and the, and the narrative's trying to help us understand that they were given free will. And so they were told in the Garden of Eden not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now, I'd love to give you a whole message on this, but let me just, let me just make one thing clear. They were made good by a good God and put in a good garden. All things were good. And so they already only had knowledge of good. So if you're eating the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil, the only thing you're adding to your life is? Evil. Evil. Yeah. And that's the same true for us, friends. Mm. So if you're going into life and you've got to make choices, you, you already are made in the image of God. You are already good. And the only choice you're making is how much evil you want to express. Mm. Because the other bit is your natural go-to place because as a new creation in Christ. So they are given an opportunity. They are told, if you eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you will what? Surely die. Now, um, we all know that they are tempted and they make a choice and they eat of the fruit of the knowledge of the tree of good and evil, blah, 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 blah. And they drop dead immediately, don't they? They just drop dead and it's the end of the Bible. It's only a two-chapter book. It's, it literally it starts with creation. They get to the tree, Adam and Eve eat it. And of course, because God wouldn't lie, would he? God doesn't lie? What, am I a man that I would lie? No? So he said, you'll die. And of course, they ate the fruit and dropped dead there and then. Because that's what we would assume dying means. Anyone? So it obviously doesn't mean that because they still seem to keep on living. So you've, start to, you've got to start to ask the question, what does that mean? Because in, in my world, when you die, you stop living. Yep. You don't eat, you don't breathe, you don't get dressed, you don't go to work, you don't, you don't do anything, you're dead. So it must mean something else. And unless you're willing to ask the question, you may not find the answer. So let me say, what, does God kill them? If you eat of the, knowledge, of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you will die. So does God kill them? So is he doing a penal punishment at this time? There's no, there's no evidence of that. So what does he do? Does he punish them by chucking them out of the Garden of Eden and into the land of Eden? Well, he expels them, but is it punishment or protection? Because some are saying now, when they think about the story, he protected them from making the knowledge of evil permanent by eating of the tree of eternal life. And so maybe, so anyone remember that this God is light, life and love? Anyone? anyone? Can he be anything else? Could be a nasty murderer. Just to sneak that in there. Because we've got light, life and love and a nasty murderer. Because that's what the gospel for many people sounds like. What if he's actually loving Adam and Eve by protecting them from a state of making their knowledge of evil permanent. Mm. What if the story is he, he expels them from a condition that could eventually harm them? And yes, they have chosen to walk off the path. Remember, it's missing the path by one degree or a lot of degrees. 
and now they're in the land of Eden and because they are a little bit further away from light, life and love, life's harder because now there's a degree of darkness and, and hate and death. A degree. Not, it's obviously hasn't happened because they're still out there. They even end up having some babies. Mm -hmm. So life, keep, life keeps going but it's less than it was. Do you see how the path is shorter or you're off the mark? You haven't, you, it's not a light switch. It's not black and white. There are degrees. And in the story, it's fairly obvious because God still relates to Adam and Eve. Now we've got Cain and Abel. And, then, and, and there's a bit of a debate between these two lads about who's, um, whose gift is better. And he says, uh, God says to him, why are you angry? Why is he angry? He's asking Cain, why is he angry? Now, is that the, a degree of not love? Mm -hmm. Is it missing the mark? Yep. Is, it, is he completely writhing with hate? No. No, that makes no, there's no statement that says that, but he is angry. And then he, then he acts out of lack of love and he takes life. Now, surely, if you're going to get this sin light switch on and off black and white thing, surely he should just die. Come, come on, mm -hmm. seriously. Yep. Like even we, we got countries that have death sentences and all this and that. We just, you know, you, you, you're taking up space, you're using good oxygen other people could use, boom, you're done. Even, even humans, we'd be happy to do that, or some would. Yeah? Now what's God do? God moves him at another step away. He protects those in Eden from the darkness and the hate and the lack of life in Cain. But, friends, you've got to see this protection thing. He also protects Cain. Right. He makes it so. So the nature of his love is still there to protect. But he's not taking free will away from them, no matter how far away from light, love and life they move. So what if sin, in the, in the narrative of the beginning story, is stepping away or moving off the path by one degree or 99 from light, Life and love. Now, the reason I use those words is because when you go to the New Testament, um, in the beginning, in John's Gospel, it talks about Jesus coming as the light and the darkness could not overcome him. So we know that's a characteristic, which is true of God and it's also true of him. Mm. We know that he comes to love, yeah, the currency, for God so loved the world, he sends his only son and Jesus came to love. He's the lover of our souls. Mm. We know that. And we know that he came to give us life in abundance. So the very nature and characteristic of what it looks like to be made in the full image of God, he reflects. Mm. And he restores it to us. I want to pop that in there so you, so you don't lose track and don't get all manky on me because thinking that sin's just black and white. What if it's more than that? Abraham. God decides, and I know we're jumping a few things, but I only got a limited time. Um, Abraham, God makes a grace covenant with him. Now, grace covenant is God does all the heavy lifting. We just go, thanks. Mm, Seriously. Yep. And so he makes this covenant with him. Now, who thinks Abraham um, was righteous? Well, you better say he was because the scriptures in the New Testament tells us that he was the righteous man. Now, what was his righteousness based on? Belief. Belief. Was his righteousness based on his goodness? No. Would you think a man that brought a curse on a nation was good? Seriously, it's just a question. So if, if I was just walking around and later today, I bought a curse on, let's not pick any nation particularly because I don't want to do it, but there was one particular country out there and my, my stupidity, my selfishness, whatever it is, uh, brought a curse upon them by God. Who would think that that was a sin? <laughs> Unless it's an evil nation. Sorry, too much interplay here for those online. Uh, let me just be very clear that if you bring a curse on a nation, you're not considered a good person. It's not considered good behaviour. And by definition, it's off the path because you were designed to bless. So Abraham is blessed to be a blessing. And anyone who curses him, God will curse. And Egypt is cursed by him when he pretends his wife is his sister. And the Pharaoh takes Mrs. Attractiveness into his home because he wants to cuddle and then finds out by God that this deceptive, cowardly Abraham, who was, by the way, the pin-up boy, the, the poster boy for faith and righteousness of the New Testament, mm. is actually got some big issues of being afraid 
that just because he's hanging around with Mrs. Attractive, everyone's going to want to kill him. And it happens twice, yep. not just once. So this is a repetitive deceptiveness. Who thinks that's sin? Who thinks that's off the path of how he's designed to be? Now, my answer is yes, I do. But the relationship covenant tells me of who God is mm. and that, yes, there are consequences for these choices, but this sin doesn't disqualify him from a relationship. It just affects his relationships with mankind. Mm. And, it, and, and it has an impact, which God's is happy to still, God still relates to him, 100% in. Why? God's doing all the heavy lifting and he's just running amok. Also, considered righteous because of his trust and faith. And I want to suggest to you that it's because when God said, how about you do this, he acted upon it. Yeah. So he did it even when he felt weird and strange. He left his homeland, which is deemed to him as righteousness. Like I left my hometown. Does, that, does it count, God? <laughs> Some people here have actually left their countries. You are obviously faithful and righteous like Abraham. Yes. As long as God asked you to do it, because that's probably the clause. And if he made a covenant with you. So, and, and Abraham's so amazing and so powerful in the scriptures as a role model that even in the New Testament, Paul says, we all in Christ become children of Abraham. Abraham. Why? Because that covenant still stands. It's an irrevocable, endless covenant. What's the place of sin with Adam and Eve? What's the place of sin with Cain and Abel? What's the place of sin in Abraham? And did it stop God pursuing them? Because if... if, if Having the knowledge of good and evil, which all of us get apparently inherited through Adam, meant that we die. Is it a light switch, which is just literally the plugs pulled out, you turn off and drop like an unplugged computer or an Android, just light switches off, you, you failed. Or is it a process of distance? Is it, is it a degree? Is it off the path? Is there degrees, like if you shoot an arrow and it hits you in the foot then, and the target's 100 metres away, that's a large miss. <laughs> and if you shoot the target and hit it in the leg of the target, you've still missed it, but you've only just missed it. It's, there's a degrees of light, life and love. And I think scripture makes this fairly clear until we get into the world of Moses. Now... God delivers his people. Who knows that? God brings his people out of slavery. And I think there's a couple of paradigms which I've never heard people really talk about, and maybe I've just missed the messages. But, and that's partly because I preach on Sundays and don't get to hear everyone else's. Um, but if Egypt was cursed, it could have been silent. <laughs> It's going through loud and clear. That's me just trying to not preach for an hour and a half and Reuben will be very glad about that. Uh, <laughs> if in the season of um, Abraham, Egypt got cursed, if in the season of Joseph, they were meant to go for, and just get some grain and live there until the famine was over and then go home rather than stay, is it possible that they ended up slaves and it not, wasn't necessarily God's plan? I'm, I'm just putting it out there. That's a Bruceism, because there's nothing in scripture that tells me that, but it, it sort of looks like that to me. We get to the time when he hears their voice and Moses, the prince of Egypt, hears uh, their cry. And then this partnership between Moses and God occurs. And then there's deliverance. And I, I do love the Prince of Egypt kids cartoon thing. My kids played it over and over again. And if you haven't seen it, you've got to see it. There's some great singing in it and you'll just have a great time. But in the story, there's a of deliverance, they are, they are a people who don't know they're a people. They are a people with a heritage, but they don't know their father. There are people who have only known slavery and the gods of Egypt, and they have a story of being a nation, but they don't have a relationship with a god. And so when they get to the mountain, and, and Moses is having a chat with this god that he's been relating to and has met face to face, interesting, is Moses a sinner? Probably. Is he allowed to see God face to face? What's that about? Um, anyway, just in case you're wondering. Um, didn't drop dead. 
There's quite a few passages where sinners in the Old Testament saw God and didn't drop dead. What's that about? Um, well, it tells you something about the nature of God. And in the garden, who forsook who? Did God forsake mankind or did mankind forsake God? Um, uh, Cain and Abel, who forsook who? Abraham, when he was doing the forsaking his wife and sister thing, you know, who was forsaking who? Who was forsaking their design and by how much? Because in the nature of God, either God doesn't change and he is like life and love, or he also has a category of angry murderer as well, which is contradictory to his nature. So some of the times I think our understanding of what sin is makes a huge accusation about the character of God more than it does about us. Because it says something about what he's trying to do, which scripture does not bear out. And, and we can prove that in Jesus later, because if he, he and the Father are one and he's restoring us to our right place, it appears to be the sin's not an issue, lost son's an issue. And we can, we'll talk about that. But Moses, in the story of Moses, we have a paradigm that comes in where the relationship between mankind is not a grace covenant. It's now a kinship covenant. And this is a manky covenant because these covenants have rules, terms and conditions and they also have consequences. It's like two, and they were a feudal time. They were tribal nations at this time. And so, what you'd do is when you were traveling around, you'd make this king would make a covenant with that king that his people could travel through their land if they wanted to get stuff and trade and all that, and they wouldn't all murder them. Um, and the, the covenant would be the two kings would meet together and they'd write down, say, two copies, one for each. They'd write on two stone tablets, they'd write down a list of the terms of the agreement. And they put Roman numerals down the side. No, they didn't. They weren't all Roman. Um, it's just us that think every covenant was written with Roman numerals around. Uh, and there'd be two tablets and the kings would make deals and they both would take a copy of those rules for the covenant and they'd put them in a special box, one each. And they'd take them back to their temple, probably to worshipping different gods, and put them in the sanctuary, this special box. And the box was called an ark. Yeah. And this is what Egypt used to do with everyone. And if you go to Egypt, you can find hundreds of arks in their, um, in their archives, and they'll have statues of their gods on them, like Anubis and various ones. And they're boxes which have in them the commandments that relate to the covenants that they've made with tribes. And um, Christians thought that there was only one ark of the covenant, and that was it. And there's hundreds out there because what they were doing, what the Israelites were doing was copying what the Egyptians did. And there's not just one Ark of the Covenant. There just happens to be the only Ark of the Covenant that relates to God is this one. The others are all fake gods, demons and whatever else. But there's bucket loads of them out there. I didn't know this. It was a shocking revelation when I found it out. I went, what? I thought there was one only in one Ark. So maybe, maybe the Raiders of the Lost Ark and at the end scene when there's all those boxes in the storehouses of the Nazis and there's hundreds of arcs, maybe that's, that's sorry, off track. Um, and so what you have, and on the top of the ark that was made, see, see, God made a covenant with Moses. And God, because you know why? Because the people rejected his first offer. So this is the first offer of God. Come, I'll rescue you. Come up the mountain all of you, and I'm going to make you a nation of priests. I will be all of your God, to all of you. You won't have, you'll all be a priest. You'll be a priestly nation. Who's heard of that in the New Testament? I'll make you a priest. Apparently it was God's idea from the beginning. Um, and I'm going to give you a promised land, and the means to get the people that are in there out is going to be hornets, hornets, like mad bees. So I'm not going to send armies in to slaughter everyone. I'm going to make their life so damn uncomfortable with hornets, they'll leave. You won't have to kill anyone. And you can't kill anyone anyway if you're a priest because you can't go and fight. So I'm going to make you a nation of people that can't fight, who will all know me. This was the deal. Come up the mountain, I'll make you all. You'll have a one-to-one. -one. You'll get in. I think it was more like the grace covenant of Abraham. I think he was offering them all that. And what happened was they didn't know him and, and it says, they literally say in one of the passages, it says, says um, Moses, you go and talk to him and ask him what he wants. What just, what, because we've heard him speak once and we didn't die. 
Surely if we hear him speak again, we will all die. In other words, they had this view of the God of Abraham that he was like the God of Egypt. And they were all mean and nasty killing ones. And so what they did is they, from their lens, they badged God, who wanted to give him a grace covenant like Abraham where sin doesn't kill you. And they offered him a kinship covenant. And the problem with this is there's two sets of stones. Yeah? Now, who's read it and, and who knows that there are five commandments on one and five commandments on the other? Is that right? Wrong. It says they were written on both sides. And they were a copy of each other. You know why? Because in a kinship covenant, you have a copy. Two co who knows they had Roman numerals down the side? You know, one to ten? No, they wouldn't have. It would have been Egyptian or Hebrew. Because there were no Romans. They weren't, on the, they weren't in there mediating this covenant, saying, hang on, I can only write in Roman. Yeah, there wasn't. So it wasn't that. So all the stupid pictures that we've got from Sunday school are wrong. And who knows that God doesn't need a temple because he already is someone. So he says, I don't want your stupid rock. Take it with you. So there are two copies of the same contract, one box. Now, here's the clue. Why is this ark so powerful? There is the, the, the angels and the wings coming in the middle on the top, like in the Egyptians would have been Anubis and all that. Here we have these angel wings and this Shekinah glory, promise, word, power, shaboom, presence of the... That's why this ark's so good is because the only one that was related to a God that actually was and would do anything. And that's why waters parted and that's why people died if they touched it. And that's why all sorts of things happened because it was real. Now, there are also 300 other arcs in different temples to all sorts of silly gods and contracts. Now, the clue with the kinship covenant was it wasn't a grace covenant. If you break the law, you have to die. And so introduced with Moses was a covenant that God didn't want. Now, when you look at the weight of the scriptures, two-thirds of the Old Testament talk about a covenant God didn't want and how he entered into it because that's what our choice was, but he entered into it promising to get us out of it. So then we have in Hebrews 8, I'm going to make a new covenant with you, and then it literally says, not like when I took you by the hand with Moses. And, and so you have this two-thirds of the Old Testament is a story about what went wrong by our choice and how we got us out of it. Now, I have gone to Bible college twice, and I, I don't, I'm not doing that to brag to you, um, uh, I'm, it's probably a sad thing, really. Um, probably shouldn't have said that. Um, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, you can just borrow just osmosis. Sleep on, sit on that smelly sofa, that I said, and you'll get it that way. Um, the, we, see, we see the scriptures, in most cases, as a linear story of God fulfilling his purposes. And we include the Old Covenant in that as if this was God's plan. But when you read the text... God was pursuing us all the way up to the end of Abraham and as soon as the Moses thing happens, we are thrown into a totally um, law-based, not God-designed covenant and he takes him two-thirds of the Old Testament to get us out of it. Yeah. And then, why, why does Jesus say you become um, sons of Abraham, not sons of Moses? Why does he say he wants to make a covenant not like when he took us by the hand out of Egypt with Moses? Because that was a kinship covenant which had death consequences in it. Now, sin, the sin that I've grown up with as a Christian, the definition and the horror and the judgment and the pain and the, the killing and the hating and the judging and the religion and the temples and the churches and, and the hate and the loathing and the, and, the, and the, you know, shame and the guilt and all the pain that we have as Christians is an old covenant version of Christianity. Yeah. Not an Old Testament version yes, of Christianity, yes. just Old Covenant. And we inherit something that God was trying to get rid of. And so what, now I see that when Jesus comes along and he has a different attitude to sin and the New Covenant has a different attitude to sin, we see it in Adam and Eve. God pursues them even though they're messed up and made some bad choices. God's connecting with them and protecting them still. We see it with Abraham. Even though he makes some bad choices and people suffer from it, he's still pursuing him, isn't it? And God's doing all the heavy lifting. And who knows in the New Covenant, God does all the heavy lifting. 
I want to read to you some of these passages and, and ask you to think about what is the place of sin in these passages. Now, I was taught the gospel is um, God made all creation good. We screwed up and God, uh, we, we invited a death sentence. And from that death sentence, um, God slowly drew us back. Um, uh, but then he went silent for 500 years. And then he had to send his son, because we're such a mess, to take our place uh, because we're a waste of space. And, and now you are hidden in Christ because he doesn't even want to see your face. And you are redeemed, bought back. Uh, the debt's been paid. Now, not only has the debt been paid, you've been forgiven as well. So the debt's been paid and you've been forgiven. So it's been paid for twice. And now, you wicked sinner saved by grace, you can be with the God who wanted to kill you in heaven. Now, I've got to tell you, as a gospel, when you, when you drill it down like that and talk about it as it's actually spoken about, there's not one word of good news in there. And the worst part of it is, it says that God is not love, light or life. And so I think we are making an accusation with that sort of gospel that's based on a misunderstanding of the place of sin. We treat it like a light switch. We act like Christians live under judgment like an old covenant. And there's some issues with that. So let me read these passages. Uh, one of the passages that was used, and, we used, and I've used it in, in, in bashing people trying to get them to become a Christian. I've done that many, many times. I'm a really good uh, basher of uh, pagans. Uh, I now think that, uh, there's, that everyone is a child of God. There are some who know it and some who don't. And it's the job of the ones who know it to help the ones who don't find it. Yeah. So the sons and daughters, some of them are lost. And the other ones should get them back for dad because they're your rallies. They're your brothers and sisters. So Romans 6.23, what a great passage. Who knows that the, for the wages of sin are death. And we, we need to preach that, brothers and sisters, until the world bends its knee and realises how wicked they are. But, but, but the, friends, the problem is that was the old covenant because Paul is speaking to old covenant people trying to get them to realise what the new covenant looks like. And, and it's a bit like God cannot look upon sin. It, it's only half of the verse and it doesn't tell us the bit that actually matters because it goes on to say, but. Now, when, when we use a sentence, like, so when I say to my wife wanted me to pack the car getting ready for a break that we're going on and I said, look, I've done this and I've done this and I've done this and I've done this, but which pretty much negates everything I just did. That's what but generally means. Do you know what I mean? And so it says, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. What if that's actually how he deals with us? What if it's not the wages of sin or death? What if it is, because it was, that's old covenant. 100% true. But you are not in the old covenant, you're in the new. And the free gift of God is eternal life for those in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. I love that. I'm, kinda, I'm, I'm in, sign me up. Romans 5.8, but God demonstrated his love for us. So when, when we repented and when we got our life together and got on our knees and prayed the sinner's prayer and went to church and tithed and when we did all of the things to prove that we were a good old covenant Jesus following Christian, that he would finally say, yes, I will forgive you, you wicked sinner. Mm -hmm. Sorry, hang on, that must be the Bible. That that's not, doesn't sound right at all. Mm -hmm. God demonstrated his love for us. Hang on, it's interesting that he's love, light and life. And that sin is a degree of departing from that. And that God does all the heavy lifting in the covenant of Abraham and we we're back in the covenant like that in the new covenant. While we were still sinners, he did this. While we were enemies of our father, he did all the reconciling for us so that he was right with us even though we're not right with ourselves or right with him. Even though we're in darkness, we're out of love and our life is drained, he is resetting the covenant equation so that you can be reconciled to him before you even ask to. So this is, this is the truth that we hear now. You know how you repent to be forgiven? A lie. You are forgiven and you repent to agree with it. That's right. I grew up, you repent and then God will forgive. What if he reconciled us in Christ 2,000 plus years ago and now I repent to agree that I'm forgiven? What if I'm... Yes. What if it's already done and I have to, all I have to do is catch up with it? That's right. So I, I don't repent to get God to do something. Mm. I repent to get the something God's already done. Amen. Amen. So forgiveness precedes repentance. So what's the place of sin in that equation, friends? What are you going to do with that? That doesn't work. You're getting judged. You're wicked. You're evil. You're hateful. You're darkness. And you're, you know, you're a sinner saved. What if you're a, what if you're a saint? 
and you sin by faith and you don't have to. Mm. What if the issue of sin isn't between you and God, it's an issue in your own heart mm. and an issue in the relationships with those around you? Mm. What if you're limiting your potential to be kingdom delivery system by living in less light, less love and less life? Mm. What, if that's, what if you're off the path a little bit and it's not a black and white light switch of judgment? What if that's possible? And what if God is still pursuing you? Jesus was sent to find the... Oh, hang on, that's pursuing. Find, seek and save the lost. It can't, yeah, exactly. So what about this one? 2 Corinthians 5.18. All, all this is from God, who reconciled us to himself in Christ Jesus and gave us the ministry of doing the same, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. Oh, my goodness, that's not very old covenant, new covenant, Christian, judgy, pain, wicked, rotten sinner... You've got to get your life together or God can't love you. Mm. No, that's old covenant. You're not in the old covenant. He doesn't want a covenant like that. What if he's calling us all up the mountain and saying, I want to make you a nation of priests? Amen. Peter thought that was true. Yeah. What if there's no water fight, but you can win every battle? Romans 8.38. Now, this is this one. We, I don't think we focus on this one enough. I'm convinced that nothing can separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus. So if death can't separate you, and that was a consequence of sin, mm -hmm. well, death and life can't separate you, angels and demons can't separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Mm -hmm. Oh, hang on a minute. You mean a demon can't separate me from the love of God? In no, it can't. Uh, neither present nor the future, nor powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation can separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. Come on. Where is the position of sin to separate you from God? The, the position of sin is God has reconciled it. You just need to agree. You need to catch up. This is what it means for God to do all the heavy lifting in Christ. This is the first son who has all the second sons. We've talked about that. There's messages. Ruth, uh, Reuben can give you um, links for that stuff. We've talked about it. We want to equip you in such a way that you stop letting sin become an issue when God's resolved it. And, but the issue is now, there's an issue of sin, isn't it? It's your limiting factor of living under the old um, nature that's dead. You have memories, you have habits, you give yourself to desires rather than heavenly design. Mm. You doubt, which is also an issue for Abraham. His issue was doubting. Uh, believing lies was Adam's issue. We do all that stuff, but God is not separate from you. Sin doesn't separate you from him. It separates you from your potential. And it also limits you from being the steward that can steward kingdom fullness. Because you won't imagine who you are. You won't agree to your assignment because you lower yourself down to the level of a judgmental old covenant sin. Who, why is the enemy called the accuser when God's not accusing you of anything anymore? He's like dragging you back in an old covenant version of Christianity so he can judge you, accuse you, condemn you and immobilise you. How many Christians live like that? I used to think, so when I was a minister for years, I'd be getting up to preach and I might have had a bad week, I might have said a bad thing, might have done a naughty thing, been a bad, bad, not a good Christian, bad, bad boy, naughty, naughty boy, naughty boy, sorry. And so I'd get up and I'd say, I want to preach, Lord. I need you to forgive me so I can hear the word of the Lord and say, I'm sorry. <laughs> Seriously, living under shame and guilt, uh, being riddled with a, a sense of inadequacy and not being qualified to preach the word of the Lord, which he had signed me to do, because the enemy was accusing me and Dad was sitting there saying, probably saying something like this, what are you talking about? <laughs> I've already, I've dealt with this. I'm, all, I'm okay. All right. The only one hurting anyone by this sin is you hurting you. Mm. Mm. So when you're dealing with people, what, what sort of gospel are you going to peddle to them? Are you going to peddle a gospel that sounds like old covenant in new covenant clothes? And I, at least 70% of what I've heard in church and in Bible college is that. And I went to strong Bible believing colleges. At least that's the definition they had of themselves. <laughs> I, I, I've got to tell you, I'm having to come up with a new gospel. Mm. Now, the gospel I'm coming up with looks like the various stories of Jesus. Let me be very clear. Mm. There is a gospel. Amen. And the gospel is God's love will find you in any place, dark, death, Amen. dark, death or loveless, mm. and will reconcile you and restore you to the dignity of who you were designed to be. Ah, 
and set you up for a future that you couldn't even imagine. Because that's what the gospel is, that Jesus came and found his brothers and sisters and put them right with dad, sat them around the table so they could have the abundance of life they were designed. They could reflect the glory of God they were designed to. What is it? Christ in you, the hope of glory for those who are yet to be saved. Yes. How cool is that? So where's the place of sin? Sin is in there, isn't it? It's just not dominant. It's not an old covenant issue for Christians. And, it, and we've made it so much so. Now, for maturity, now we talked about this last night, leadership and discipleship is the model of God multiplying family kingdom business. We talked about this last night. Yeah. Um, and you get promoted not to uh, have significance or power or position. You get invited to do something because you have a life worth imitating at some level in some way. And if you have an area of sin in your life and it's not worth imitating, we're not going to ask you to lead in that area. That's right. Now, it, it, for, in some ways with leadership, in some ways sometimes we'll ask you to step back and resolve an issue, which doesn't mean you reject it. It means we want you to have a bit of therapy, a bit of therapeuo, a bit of healing, a bit of heart healing, so that your life isn't um, too contradictory between the revelation of your growth and an area where it's broken to an extent where you're harming people. But sometimes your sin's just against you and we want to minister to you so that you become a leader who in, in increasingly has a life worth imitating. Mm. Now, I won't lead you in areas that I'm still working on because otherwise I'll just sow rotten fruit into you and all you'll have is more. But if I've had a victory, I can lead you at least into that. And maybe there's 10 steps in that and I only know two. Well, I'll lead you in two and then pass you on to someone that knows how to do three to ten. And this is what, is what it means to be family teaching each other. It, this is what it means to be passing on what you receive. That's what Jesus said, isn't it? Give away what you receive, freely you receive, freely give. But I don't want you to give away ideas on sin that look like you're stu stuck in the temple with a high priest, sacrifice and a bull once a year on an altar and, and rams and lambs and chasing them out into the bush do you understand? I don't want you to act like there's any more sacrifice. I don't want you to act like only one person can talk to the God and the rest of us are plonkers that just have to listen to that donkey. Mm. I don't want you to act like that any man-made ceremony to appease God who's angry and wants to kill us actually has any reflection on who he is. It has more reflection on the dumb counter offer we made him rather than, and sometimes we're still doing it. Christians are making deals with God when they have the free gift of everything. Lord, if you'll just do this, I'll do this. And God said, I was going to do it anyway. What are you doing that bit for? You're making a dumb deal. I said, come up the mountain, I'll make a nation of priests and I'll drive out your enemies with hornets. And you'll go, well, I'll give you this and I'll do this and I'll suffer here and I'll do this. And he's going, oh man, this Moses thing's contagious. It's going down through the generation. I've said, Jesus, he's fixed it all and you're going back to making trade-off deals. Stop it. Now, I have been radically challenged by watching my brother Reuben. Um, they do, they've done outreaches, um, schoolies, they've done um, New Year's Eve outreaches. And that, what they do is they meet people and, 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 and they don't use the proper script, you know, to sin. You're not dealing with sin because these people are wicked. They seem to be more interested in love and life and light, and speaking words that set people up for their God's preferred future, rather than dealing with their past, labelling them by it, nailing their foot into the past so they can't get away from it, and just continually get them to come, come to the cross again, and come to the cross again, and that sin that was already paid for, come again, and ask for forgiveness, you haven't got it. Come again. What if God's already sorted it out, and he's happy, and the only one left Amen. is you? Amen. And what if the issue is how you treat yourself and treat others, and, that's the, and, and your potential's not being reached. So these guys do an amazing job. And it forced me to rethink. And then I went back and actually read the Bible. Fancy that. And I looked at several stories of Jesus. And, and, and who knows we're meant to follow him. Yes. He is the example. So I'm reading all these encounters with Jesus with a centurion healing a, a sick person. And sin wasn't mentioned. 
And I'm thinking, what the hell's wrong with you, Jesus? You don't understand the story. You haven't got enough sin judgment in your... Oh, hang on, it's Jesus. I'm meant to be following him, not the other way around. And then there's this woman caught in adultery. And he, he, even, he even circumnavigates the existing law, because he's a Jew. It's so amazing, such a good story. And restores her like a dad would to a lost daughter. Yes. Makes my heart cry, it really does. And then he says, you don't have to live this way. In other words, don't sin anymore. It's not a light switch, it's not black and white. It's don't walk on this path anymore. Walk into the light and love and life that you are to have. And he, and, and he gives it to her. Like, feel that. Holy Spirit's all over that. He just gives it to her before she asks. What about Zacchaeus? There's no mention of him repenting either. Little tree climbing shorty. <laughs> he just has a, has a feed with Jesus who knows his name and changes his whole life. Changes his... A very rich shorty, tree climbing shorty. What about... What about... This one's good. What about... The demonized man who's so loathed by his town that they've driven him into the hills to live among the dead. Mm. He is dead living among the dead. Nude, running around, nutcase. Right? Yep. Nobody will love him. And Jesus... Wow. He, just, he, he steps beyond all of the things that we say are limitations. Mm. He steps against the sins against that man, the abuses that were to him. Who knows how he got into that state of mind to start with. And the man is so over, overrun by the pursuit of God's love. Life comes to where there's death. Love comes to where there's hate. Light comes to where there's darkness. And at the end of the story, he's sitting at Jesus' feet, fully clothed, and it says, in his, his right, right mind. mind. And then he says, I want to come with you. I don't want to stay here with people who treat me like this. Mm. And Jesus says, no, I need you to... Now, it's the first time, because Gentiles, he says, I need you to stay and tell what I've done for you. And you know the feeding of the 4,000 takes place in that area because the crowd comes because of this man, I reckon. Mm. Mm. What about the woman at the well? Mm. Now, now, we read that. Now, so this, here's, the, here's the awfulness of judgmental Christianity which is so obsessed by sin and sexual sin and all the rest of that, that we will slaughter people emotionally and relationally and judge them and condemn them. So most Christians over the years that I've seen have read that story and said, when Jesus says, has that prophetic word, um, you've had five husbands and the one you're with is not your husband. They go, you know, there's words we can use for loose women like that. You know, that's where people go, isn't it? But what if... In their culture, the woman doesn't have a right to divorce anybody and it's the husband that does the divorcing. Yeah. What if she's the result of abuse mm. again and again, which is what probably happened, mm. and Christianity has stood on its lofty high judgmental horse judging sin that didn't exist. Mm. And now she's living with the scraps of relational life because that's all. no one's going to touch her. Do you understand? What if the, the lens of sin so distorts us from the, the loving outreach of God that we don't see that life and light and love has been restored and he's dragging us back, kicking and screaming into it? So here's this woman at the well having all these ridiculous discussions and debates about what hill you worship on and all the rest of this nonsense until at the end she's just undone. She runs back to her hometown. Now she's out in the middle of the day. Why? She's full of shame. She runs back to her town. What's she doing running back to the town that's shaming her? Tells everybody, come and meet the one who's just brought light, life and love into my life. And apparently sin didn't get, didn't get a Guernsey at all. It doesn't even... You know, they, the Western, no, Eastern Church says that this lady, her name is Panini. And she is one of the most amazing evangelists who went around the world, around the region, uh, witnessing to the love of God in Christ Jesus and seeing many people saved. You know why the church doesn't grow? Because we smell like Gehenna. Yeah. We stink of judgment. Still have the confession box around. Yeah. We're still running up to get something that's already freely been given. We're still obsessed by sin instead of being obsessed by righteousness. And your righteousness is not your goodness. It wasn't Abraham's. Remember? Deceitful, 
It wasn't his goodness that was his righteousness, and it's not yours. Your goodness is not your righteousness, but it is if you're under Moses, because that was law equal goodness. Good, bad, light switch, on, off, life, death, but you're not in that covenant, and sin doesn't get to play that role in the new covenant, but I am so, so tired of being in a church where it still does. Mm. It has a place. I've already described that, but it is not that place. Mm. So when we reach out to the world, if Jesus didn't make sin an issue that stopped the love of God transforming them, how dare we? And leaders, you're going to have to grapple with what does it mean to rewrite your heart and mind story around the gospel so it lines up with Jesus, not with Moses. Amen. I'm not against Moses. I'm not, I'm not against him. Yep. But you better become a person that looks like Jesus with love and how he deals with sin, not like poor Moses who had to do this counteroffer that he didn't want. He didn't. Remember, the people sent him up with the right. counteroffer. Right. It wasn't his desire either. Exactly. So I, I need us. And, and, and the problem is that you, many of you have grown up in churches where sin, you've been condemned by it as a Christian. Yeah. Yeah, even Jesus says about judgment, because judgment would be sin related, wouldn't it? He said, do not judge. He said, don't do it. Like, I, I, I like the idea that Jesus gets the judgment seat. Who knows that? Jesus get, gets that. Um, and, and there's no right for you to bum cheek him off it. You know, it's like we're trying to sit there and we say, Jesus, come and sit on the judgment seat. And then when it comes to judging someone, we get up next to him, try to bum cheek him off it so that we can judge people the way we want to. And then we let him have it. So, you, so I often do this with people that come in. I sort of push them with my hip. And you sort of whack at them, trying to get them to move. And that's what we're trying to do to Jesus. I've got to tell you, he's firmly fixed on that seat. It's a waste of time trying to bum cheek him off that seat. Mm. It's not going to happen. But you know what happens in you? Is you step, you, you actually sin because you step out of the path right. of light and life and love, which is the glory of God and it's what Jesus came to do and it's what God came to do and you are made his image and he has reconciled mankind to himself while Amen. he didn't even ask for it. Amen. And so if that's how he deals with sin, how are you going to? Now, leaders, if you're going to set church up for success, the highest currencies better be the same currency that God values. And, I, and I'm sad to say that there are churches that value judging sinners more than they do the forgiveness that they've already been offered. Mm. Mm. And, I, and I'm embarrassed and I'm, I'm ashamed for, for the reputation of Jesus and for the character of God when that happens and I will not partner with them. Now, I'm sitting here partnering with this, this wonderful, eclectic, um, international family because they're better at this than I am. They're better at this than I am. They know how to love people beyond their problems. They get promises more valuable than problem. They get hope is more value than I'm lost. They get it and they do it. And I need you to know that that has to be the currency of your heart. And you have to rewrite the text that has made sin the dominant characteristic of grace. It's not. Grace and love make sin displaced. Sin is the symptom of not knowing who I am. It's not powerful anymore. When you, when you don't know who you are, you, you revert to desires away from design. And, and you self-medicate with habits that compensate for the true destiny you were designed for. That's all sin is. And it affects you and it affects those around you. And it can be restored. But you're already forgiven. So live forgiven. And, and, I, and I'm ashamed of how I've treat, treated people in the past, how I've been an old covenant believer. In, in following Jesus and judging people like they're under the old covenant, I'm ashamed of what I've done in my heart. And I'm, and I'm working on not being that man anymore because it doesn't look like my, my saviour. It doesn't look like the way he wants to treat me. And that's why I'm asking you to think about getting on the right side of sin because you can't lead somebody into the full freedness, freedom that Jesus has done, into the new covenant that makes us have a righteousness that's because of the relationship, not because of our goodness. Read my book. I, I, make a, I challenge people to reassess their 
um, understanding of what righteousness means in the New Testament. I, my Bible college would have a heart attack at that chapter. They would have a heart attack. Even though it's 100% biblically proved in what I've written, they would still be blind guides. Mm. 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 So, friends, let's pray. I'm getting too emotional. I'm getting undone. Whoa. Thank you that we can be on the right side of sin. Jesus' side. Thank you that just missing a mark doesn't mean I've missed my future or my potential. Thank you that forgiveness precedes repentance. Thank you that I'm in a covenant where the light and life and love of God is dominant. And thank you for all the stories of what he did so I can actually follow his example and know that neither death nor height, angels, demons, nothing can separate me from the love of God in Christ Jesus. And that's what I can offer everyone else. Amen? Amen. Amen. So we're going to have a workshop time and there's going to be some breakout rooms and Ruben's going to manage that. Um, and there's going to be, you're going to be asked to ask some questions. So let me give you a clue of what I'm hoping you'll do. I'm asking you to, to not answer what you think is right, to find out what you actually think. Because remember that Corinthians passage where it says, "Take every thought, um, demolish everything that stands up against the knowledge of God." Mm. And so sometimes we have an opinion about what sin looked like in the garden that God doesn't have. Mm. And you may need to find out what you think, and then look at what God thinks, and then get a wrecking ball out and tear tear to pieces the thing that you've had. You might have an idea about sin in the covenant of Abraham, or sin in the covenant of Moses, or sin in the covenant of Jesus that you need to bring a wrecking ball to. Um, yep, I'll let people just take a screenshot or a picture of that. So we're going to work on that. That's only one list. Because I, I think you need to know that when it hits the Moses time frame, that we're thrown, out of, we're thrown off the path. Then there's another list. Now, how does sin affect righteousness? I am sick to death of people saying righteousness is our goodness. Now, you need to ask yourself in your heart whether you still believe righteousness is your goodness. Is that how you pay? When you talk about it, well, they're not very righteous. Well, you're talking about how they're behaving, aren't you? And if you can't tell yourself the truth, this is about being emotionally aware. This is about being, being honest with yourself. This is about one of those Kairos moments where heaven's trying to invade earth and get you to see things from heaven's perspective, not force heaven to see things the way you do. And then the last one. How does our idea of sin influence the gospel we share? Because we can't get that good news. Well, if it's Gehenna and you call it good news, it just stinks like death still. And the reason that people don't flock to the church is we don't look like Jesus mm. in how we deal with sin. We don't get its place now. We don't offer forgiveness before repentance. A friend of mine um, I heard him speak. He'll go up to people and he'll say, oh, um, there'll be a chat and he'll say, oh, do you believe in Jesus? And they go, no. And he says, why not? And they go, what do you mean? He says, well, he believes in you. And they go, yeah, but he, well, no, but he loves you. No, he doesn't. He's forgiven you. Well, no, he hasn't. He couldn't. And then they start to tell them all the old covenant reasons that they've heard from society mm. that tells them why they're disqualified. Mm. And, and then this guy keeps saying, yeah, oh, yeah, God's already dealt with that. No, God's reconciled himself to you. He's pursuing you. He loves you. He, he says you're already in. He's just waiting for you to agree. Now, that's a gospel that's just all pervasive, loving, and it hunts you down like you're a wild animal and catches you. Mm. Being captured by the love of God. That's you. That's you. <laughs> All right. So they're the questions that we're going to have a look at. Ruben's going to direct the breakout rooms. I'm going to do a live room here with some people here and see if I can get you to peel back your uh, belief system enough to, to be truthful with yourself. Um, so we've got, uh, let's say, half an hour and then five minutes feedback at the end from group leaders. Okay. So uh, thank you, Bruce. We're going to, uh, I think, Pops Matthew and myself and... Uh, Pastor John and Pastor Edwina, where give us about five minutes. We've got to go upstairs physically, uh, Pops Matthew and myself, to set up. We'll do breakout rooms for those online. Um, Padre Bruce and uh, Papa Luke will be here with you guys physically mm. and do that, and we'll be back in 30 minutes together. I'm not going to leave the room. Thank you. <laughs> so just give us um, Online, just give us about five minutes. We'll just move location and come and then get the breakout rooms organized. 
So you can take a toilet break if you need to. Wonderful. Hope you guys can hear us. I will just stop the share. Awesome. Hello, everyone. We are just going to set up the... Uh, Breakout rooms, do let me know if you can hear me okay. Yes, can hear you. Okay, I'm getting thumbs up. That's great. Uh, Pops Matthew, you're on. Good. Pastor John, you're here. And Pastor Dwina, where are you? There you are. Awesome. Um, give me a couple.